Welcome to Pittsburgh Hockey Now, 30 minutes, pure hockey talk, no fanboys, no benders. From Pittsburgh Hockey Now, I'm Dan Kangerski. Welcome back, the professor, Mr. Bob Healy. Coming up on today's program, we'll get into the face-off segment. We'll talk about Vegas and the goaltending debacle that they're having, injuries just befalling that team. We'll also take a look at the NHL rumor mill and the first coach on the hot seat. Yeah, not to mention the backup goalie situation uh, for Pittsburgh, some struggling teams around the Eastern Conference, uh, a, a look at high school hockey and RMU. But first, Dan, are the Penguins suffering from a hangover? Mike Sullivan says it's no excuse. I think you agree. Well, it's not just an excuse. It's also not true. The Penguins have shown up for several games this season. You know, those statement games, which are very important to show up for, the Penguins have shown up for. What they're suffering from right now is a personnel issue. They're not getting any offense or puck possession from their third and their fourth lines. Riley Sheehan, especially, one point in 13 games this season. We take a look at, at the stats here, the Penguins' third and fourth line centers. One point. And if you, in fact, if you take away Sheehan's uh, game against Winnipeg mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. on um, Sunday or, or Monday, whatever it was, it seems like forever ago, where they credited him with four shots, take that away, he has just one shot as a Pittsburgh Penguin, one scoring chance. In fact, that's I, not good enough. His best scoring chance to me was one where he completely missed the net. It was early in the season. That's yeah. happened. In fact, in Winnipeg, he was credited with four scoring chances, yeah. and you should have more than four shots on goal. And in fact, if you go back to the tape, I, I'd be hard pressed to find a few of those shots. Now, we saw the Greg McKay numbers, too. They're a little bit better than Shea's, but so has everybody been in the NHL the last two years. He yeah. just hasn't put up points, but it's about more than points, right? So take a look at this heat map we have for Riley Shahan and how he's performed on offense. Dan, what are we looking at here, and why is well, it important? You know, this counts the Winnipeg game in, in which, you know, the, the, I think they were a bit generous scoring-wise. You can see some red there in front of the net. That's good. Look at those deep blue pockets around the offensive zone. That means nothing is happening over there compared with the rest of the, the Penguins team you see big red swatches in front of the net and around the rest of the zone uh, one scoring chance in five games one shot in five games just isn't good enough now that's especially important not just in terms of putting up numbers but when we think back about the Penguins two back-to-back -back Stanley Cup Finals teams of recent memory. 08-09, you had center depth, all the way down to Jordan yeah. Stahl and even down to Craig Adams. Then 16-17, we're talking to Benino and to Matt Cullen. Now you're missing, you know, those guys didn't put up huge numbers, but they did enough offensively to put the defense on their heels, wear them out for the number one line to come out. Absolutely. If Crosby and Malkin lines are playing defense, that means they're not playing offense. Uh -huh. If they're coming back into the defensive zone, and those third and fourth lines have put them in the defensive zone because they're, you know, Corsi-wise, they're 70 and 75 and 80 percent on their heels. They're not generating enough. So if Crosby and Malkin are playing defense, that means they're not playing offense. That means you're not getting enough scoring chances. And the bulk of the Penguins' offense will always come, as rightfully it should, from those top six lines. So the third and fourth lines have been struggling to put up offensive numbers, uh, particularly the two men we mentioned. Now let's talk about the Penguins' top six unit. When healthy, we want to show you a graphic here about how much money is tied up in those top six. Well, the top six defense, yeah. The, look right here, the Penguins' defense the third highest paid blue line in the NHL. Now, there's not a bad defenseman on that board right, right there, right. but the production doesn't equal the payments. You know, they're, they're paying a lot for, and not getting as much. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone to tell you that they're one of the five or, or ten best units in the NHL. They signed Brian Dumoulin to a, a, a full market value contract as a restricted free agent. And his game is very similar to Ole Mata's game, and now we've seen them shuffle the deck and put Mata with Chris Letang. And so there's a bit of homogeny on the Penguins' defense that isn't serving them very well. And in fact, they're getting blitzed because they're the worst Corsi defense in the league right now. So moving back from center red all the way to the goal line, Tristan Jerry, recent call-up. Uh, maybe we're getting into too much here. I think Tristan Jerry might be auditioning to be a potential trade piece for Ooh, an offensive interesting. thing later because I think the Penguins feel like they can get away with the backup that they have who's back down in the AHL. 
but I, I think Jerry is not going to ever be a number one goalie here, so this could be a tryout to get them possibly some uh, help on those top forward lines, and that's just uh, one man's opinion on that. We'll see. We'll see. But we have video of Tristan Jerry. I want to show you how well he has performed historically. Now, this year his numbers are somewhat down, but look at the athleticism here in Wilkes-Barre. Yeah, he, he had a terrible start. That's why DeSmith came up, and I'll disagree with you on the DeSmith being Well, a, well. I'm... But right there, Jerry's not a big goaltender. He's six foot one, but he squares to the shooter. He plays big. And here, look at the athleticism that he displays. Sliding over to take a, a scoring chance away from Chris Bork, who's got plenty of NHL experience there. I remember that guy. Uh, yeah, you remember that guy. Yeah. And so Jerry is an NHL goaltender right now. And he solidifies that Penguin's backup goaltending situation. Yeah. But you're right, he, he might yeah, he, be... Number one one day, not here. Uh, that's yeah. a very interesting So we'll point. see how that plays out. Now, there are other teams struggling around the East that are doing far worse than the Penguins are. Expectations, of course, here are high, having won back-to-back Cups. But let's talk about the uh, Eastern Conference. Take a look at the standings here. Washington Capitals, no bueno. Yeah, they're outside the playoff picture. Look at that. They're struggling with that hangover as well. They're, they're finding it difficult to get up. They're also very top-heavy in Washington. Barry Trotz, you know, it's interesting. I don't want to put trots on the hot seat, but if Washington's struggles continue, you have to maybe look at scrubbing the room clean because they have that hangover. They talked about how the history with the Penguins affected them, and he tried to downplay that. So you have, you have that schism with the general manager and the players in Washington agreeing that the Penguins kind of hang over their head, and the coach saying, no, 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 trying to downplay it. Maybe, you, you, you know, you've got different pages there in Washington. Western Conference, led by uh, Coach Joel Quenville, whom you'll see in the video coming up here. Yeah, Chicago, just like Pittsburgh right now. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, they're one of those teams that maybe, I, I know I, in the first episode we had, I'll uh, take a look at the Quenville video. The first episode I had, uh, or, or that we had of the show, I predicted that Chicago was going to be a better team this year, and so far, no, not so. Well, very, a lot of confidence and a lot of momentum and a lot of pace to our game, and I think you uh, you know, our, our confidence uh, probably more so putting the puck in the net and scoring goals, whether that uh, gives you a little uncertainty in the scoring area or slows you down with the puck. Uh. Look at the face Quinville makes at the end there. Uh, he, bags, he essentially bag skated the boys on Tuesday. You know, he made him skate till their legs hurt and then went a little more, trying to get his team's attention. They're without Marion Hosa this year is Chicago, and so they're trying to find, you know, a bit more uh, spark in Chicago, bringing back Sada and Sharp hasn't really done it. And like you mentioned, uh, their backup goaltending uh, hasn't been great as well. Anton Forsberg came from Columbus in that uh, Tyler Mott and Panarin deal, and it just you know, hasn't been working great in Chicago. They've got to find a spark as well. Bob, I want to talk to you about a brand new sponsor here on Pittsburgh Hockey Now, Bardownski Hockey Sticks. Or in Pittsburgh, we pronounce it Bardansky. Tell you what, hockey parents and clubs save a ton of money. Get your great sticks at half price and an individual wrap. Your child's name, number, your team wrap, all on that. Go to BardownskiHockey.com. We'll take a quick break. We'll take a look at some, uh, also some local hockey, too. We'll come right back with the Rumor Mill segment here on Pittsburgh Hockey Now. Michaela here for Pittsburgh Hockey Now. Tonight we're at the Alpha Ice Complex covering the Peters Township versus Central Catholic game. Last season was the last time these two teams saw each other when the Indians defeated the Vikings during the AAA playoffs last season. Well, it looks like Peters Township and Central Catholic, but relatively new teams from their Penguin Cup from a year ago. Uh, Central lost a lot of firepower from their team, as did Peters Township. So I'm coming out to look and see you know, what these teams are made of, you know, early in the season. Yeah, it's a rematch of the Penguins Cup final from last year between Peters and Central Catholic. And, uh, you know, Central Catholic lost a lot more in the terms of graduating players than Peters did. So I was expecting this to be a game where Peters had the advantage, and that's pretty much the way it played out. But I saw a really tough physical effort from Central Catholic, and I thought it was a great game, a really a great exhibition of what PIHL hockey is all about. Uh, two really talented teams really going at it. And, you know, Peters gets a 4-2 win, but I really thought Central Catholic acquitted themselves pretty well. The Peters team is really good. Yeah, I think uh, Ryan Lee, the defenseman for Peters, is a fantastic two-way player. There were a couple times where, you know, he'd make a defensive play right in front of his own goal and then lead the rush all the way down the other end of the ice. That's not something you see a lot of at this level, and it's a pretty rare skill. And Connor Gilarowski is another player, uh, 77 for Peters Township. Two-way player, does great things on defense, but also very dangerous offensively. And I think both of those, both of those players have 
have really solid futures. And you know, for Central, there's there's a lot of opportunities there for a lot of these players, to, for somebody to step up. And you know, for us to say in in two or three years, wow, look at all these guys, Central's losing again. Um, but they're young, and and they're going to take the time to go through that process and and build throughout the season. But for it being October, I thought they acquitted themselves really well against a really deep veteran Leighton Peters team. Yeah, absolutely. They're only three games into the season right now. So looks like our next game is starting. So we're going to wrap it up for Pittsburgh Hockey Now. I'm Michaela Hall. Alan Saunders. Welcome back to Pittsburgh Hockey Now. I'm Dan Kingerski, along with the professor, Bob Healy. want to thank Michaela Hall of Duquesne University and our good buddy, Alan Saunders of Pittsburgh Hockey Digest for that high school hockey report. Michaela, actually a student working with Pittsburgh Hockey Now. She's a student at the Duquesne University, who uh, provide their lovely facilities here for this little television show, and give us the professor, Mr. Healy. So we thank Duquesne University for all of that. It's been a pleasure. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, let's take a look at some fan favorites around the league. You know, we, we look at guys like Rick Tockett. Greener pastures, maybe not so much in Arizona. Well, there's not much green in Arizona. <laughs> it's mostly sand. So down there in Glendale, things have not been pretty strong right now for Rick Tockett. Uh, take a look at the graphic here. Here's how the Coyotes have fared so far this year. Dan, it's already a tough situation in Glendale. Not made any easier with these marks. No. In fact, according to the NHL Network, this was the second worst start in NHL history, tied with the 95-96 Sharks. A little fun fact. Tied with the 1927-28 Pittsburgh Pirates. Yeah, the original black and gold hockey team. In, in I didn't even know they existed. That's right. That's how the Bruins didn't have a leg to stand on in the argument when the Penguins switched their You colors. know, they, they've not been closing out games. They've been having goaltending issues as yeah, well. Yeah, they Phoenix. really have. Uh, Louis Domingue, is he on the team? He's not on the team. Two days ago, he's sent down. Then he's recalled today for cap purposes. We're talking the Thursday. He was sent down Wednesday. Um, you know, they, they face a lot of shots against. They're in seven games played, Domingue an 856 save percentage. They're getting leads, but they're not closing out games. It's been one problem after another in Arizona. Yeah, you've got some great scoring there from Clayton Keller, a Calder Trophy candidate. There's something to work with. Hopefully, Tockett can pull it all together. Some other uh, fan favorites here in Pittsburgh we can take a look at. Nick Benino, top of the list, took the big money, went to Nashville. And this is kind of why the Penguins wanted to get fresher legs in their bottom six. Five games into the season, he goes down with a lower body injury, had just one goal to start the season. We can turn the page to Trevor Daly as well, the speedy defender. Brought electricity, I thought, to uh, the Pittsburgh blue line. One assist in 13 games. Well, Detroit's got a number of problems. We'll talk about their head coach, Jeff Blaschel, later in the face-off segment because we think maybe he is possibly on the chopping block. You're thinking Elaine Vigneault. We'll get to that. Chris Kunitz, another former Penguin. Now, Kunitz is still playing like Chris Kunitz. Take a look at this video highlight we have of Chris tilting the ice. You know, look, battling in front of the net. This is a bit of what the ingredient the Penguins are missing, a bit of that snarl that uh, Kunitz brought to the game, battling in front. Here he is, hard on the puck behind the net creating a turnover. There it is, out in front. Wait for it. Wait for it. There's Kunitz finishing, getting the garbage in front and the goal. And that's kind of maybe what the Penguins are missing a little bit of, second chances, gritty play in front of the net. Yeah, and I know what you're thinking, Marc-Andre Fleury. Marc-Andre Fleury. <laughs> We're going to get to Marc-Andre Fleury. That's going to come up later in the face-off segment. A number of things still to come in that third segment. But for the rest of this segment, we got to address the rumor mill, right? So there's a, a number of possible trades that could happen. Dan caught up with somebody. Let's talk it to uh, Lyle Richardson, right? Thank you. And you know what? We're privileged now. We get to do our, our very first uh, guest here on Pittsburgh Hockey Now. One of the pioneers of the hockey internet age. Uh, I'm starting to feel old. Mr. Lyle Richardson of SpectresHockey.net of the Hockey News, uh, and he and I kind of began the hockey internet, uh, began at the same time, but I'm not going to say how long ago. Lyle, <laughs> how, how are you, sir? I'm fine, Dan. It's good to, uh, good to talk to you again. Yeah, geez, it, it's starting to make me feel really old that you, know, you and I have been kicking around now in these same circles forever. But I want to get into the rumor mill segment here on Pittsburgh Hockey now. And I want to start with uh, the big domino around the NHL, Lyle, and that is Matt Duchesne. Um, he essentially had his bags packed before training camp and told the team, okay, enough of this, get me out of here. Season starts, the guy looks like the old Matt Duchesne, he's putting up points, and all of a sudden, uh, maybe he isn't that big dominoes. What do we know about the whole Matt Duchesne saga and where it stands now? 
Well, where it stands currently, he's still considered to be uh, on the trade block. Um, even though he's playing well, he's off to a good start. He hasn't let uh, all the distraction of all the uh, the trade speculation from the offseason uh, get to him. He's being very professional, and uh, he's, he's working well with his teammates. But the word is uh, he is still uh, on the block, and the abs are willing to move him for the right price, and that's the key factor. Uh, the Avalanche, uh, Avs GM Joe Sackick, has not set a low price. He wants, it's believed, at least uh, a good young player, preferably a young, established top four defenseman, the left-hand shot. Uh, they'd also like a first-round draft pick and a top prospect thrown in. That's considered, you know, the consensus being that's the minimum that he's seeking right now. <laughs> yeah. and so far, he hasn't gotten that offer yet. Well, it, it surprised me that Pittsburgh had kicked the tires. I almost wondered if they kicked the tires in an effort to keep the price high because it seems to me that Columbus or, or Nashville are the two most likely landing destinations for him. Absolutely. Uh, it's well known that uh, Nashville GM uh, David Poyle is very interested in getting uh, getting Matt Duchesne. He wants to shore up uh, his depth there at center, especially since Mike Fisher's retirement. Uh, but it's the uh, the Blue Jackets that are the most intriguing. They've got the most depth in uh, young prospects they can offer. Uh, there was talk that uh, defenseman Ryan Murray was uh, part of a proposed offer, that young winger uh, Sonny Milano was another one uh, that was uh, – possibly involved in that ta offer that's apparently still on the table. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how things develop. But, yeah, definitely down to uh, the Blue Jackets and Preds right now. Well, uh, real quickly, I want to get to uh, two teams then. Montreal is just all over the map, aren't they, Lyle? I mean, uh, Mark uh, Bergevin is scouting the Islanders. He's on the West Coast scouting. What do you think they end up doing? Galchenyuk's on the block he here of them. Um, they could go a thousand different directions. Well, the latest word, I mean, uh, uh, Bergevin had a, a sort of a State of the Union uh, speech there last week, and he said, look, there's not going to be any trades coming. Don't look for them. Any help we're going to get are going to come from within. And, and since he made that statement, the Habs have uh, won three of their last four, heading into tonight's game against Minnesota. Uh, Galchenyuk, who you'd mentioned, was rumored to be on the block. I mean, he's still playing on the fourth line, but he's, uh, he's, he's uh, scored in each of his last three games. So, uh, you know, it looks like perhaps maybe things aren't quite so dire if they kind of uh, continue along their winning ways right now. Uh, but uh, nothing's really uh, settled there yet. There's even talk that uh, Andrew Shaw, that uh, perhaps the New York Rangers might be interested in him. Yeah, you know, uh, I wanted to talk to you a bit about the Rangers. We're out of time, unfortunately, so you know what? We'll have to wait a few weeks, and we'll bring you back uh, via Skype here, and I want everyone to check out spectershockey.net and catch uh, Lyle's uh, work in the hockey news as well. Sir, always a pleasure to talk to you, this time finally kind of face-to-face. Kind of. Looking forward to talking to you again, Dan. All right. Thank you. Thank you to my old buddy Lyle Richardson for coming on in the Rumor Mill segment. Coming up, the face-off segment here on Pittsburgh Hockey Now. We'll debate if Daniel Sprong should be in the NHL. The hot surprise that sticks and first coach on the hot seat. All coming up, Pittsburgh Hockey Now. Robert Morris Women's Hockey ranked 10th in the NCAA. The Colonials have been nationally ranked in at least one major poll in each of the last 20 weekly polls dating to December 6, 2016. The RMU women are on a lengthy road stretch to start the season, posting a 5-1-2 record in their first eight games. One final road weekend wrapping up this afternoon as the Colonials are at College Hockey America Conference foe Lindenwood. An impressive start to the season for the defending CHA champions, with reigning league player of the year Brittany Howard becoming the program's all-time scoring leader in the opening weekend and was this week named the CHA Player of the Month for October. Howard has nine goals and 15 points through the first eight games, averaging nearly two points per game to start her senior campaign. Howard, a draft pick of the Buffalo Buttes of the National Women's Hockey League, was taken 10th overall in that draft this past summer. The RMU women uh, played their home opener on Friday, November 10th, against RIT. On the men's side, a bit of a slow start for the Colonials, who have just two wins in the opening seven games of this season. Robert Morris was picked second in the preseason poll after a runner-up finish in 2017 and most of the team returning. As anticipated, it's senior forward Brady Ferguson leading the way offensively, Ferguson, an invitee to Penguins development camp this past summer, is the NCAA's career-leading scorer with 125 points, more than a point-per-game player for his career. He has three goals and four assists so far this season. It's Pittsburgh product Luke Lynch with the team goals lead. The sophomore from Shaler area has five goals and an assist in the first seven games and is playing roles on both the power play and penalty kill units. Robert Morris is home tonight, Saturday night, 
in Atlantic Hockey Conference action against Holy Cross at 7.05 p.m. at the RMU Island Sports Center on Neville Island. Tickets, of course, are available at the door and for just $10. There's your Robert Morris University men's and women's hockey updates for Pittsburgh Hockey Now. I'm Bob Healy. Welcome back to Pittsburgh Hockey Now. Dan Kingerski, Bob Healy. It's the face-off segment, so strap on the foil. Get ready. Here we go. Coming up in the face-off segment, we'll talk about coaches on the hot seat. We'll also talk about early surprises that may stick or may not. First, Bob, Daniel Sprong. Yeah, I've seen enough. Let, let's see Daniel Sprong now. I, I'm, I'm that in the uh, NHL. Yes, of course. Um, this is Daniel Sprong in the AHL, which you're seeing right now. Very good numbers. Keep in mind, too, when he played a bit at a cup of coffee previously in the NHL, he did produce a little bit as well. We're also going to see pretty soon a highlight video. I'm just going to call it simply Daniel Sprong doing good things. Watch Daniel Sprong doing things that you cannot teach. I, nothing against Greg McKaig, Riley Sheehan, but Daniel Sprong with that shot. You're going to see him with, with the hands and feet soon here, with quick hands, quick feet, things that just simply, as a better athlete, you cannot teach. He's younger. I think this is a guy who possibly could solve scoring problems on the third or fourth line for the Penguins, especially third line. That's right. Here he is that. in an overtime period. Look at that. That's brilliant stick handling and, and speed from Sprong. And I understand a lot of fans and a lot of people say, look, they look at that clip and they say, I want that in the NHL. Give it to me now, like, like a kid it. with a yeah. new toy. Yeah. Um, let me tell you why Daniel Sprong won't be in the NHL. Take a look at these highlights here. This is exactly why Sprong won't be in the NHL. Here he is floating in the defensive zone. There's the play you've got to make. You've got to be to that wall. You've got to get that loose puck. It results in a great scoring chance against his team. That's bad. That's Daniel Sprong yeah, doing that, bad. Doing bad things. Okay. Here, here's a turnover in the, in the offensive zone, and he floats past it. Now, fans will see Sprong here get the offensive scoring chance but he only got that offensive scoring chance because he floated past the play and didn't get back or on the puck in the nhl bob that turnover in the in the zone the other team's going the other way they're at the red line with a three on two and sprong still in the corner kind of watching the puck that's why he's not in the nhl i see daniel sprong as coachable still i don't think it's anything that can't be solved in the ahl okay well maybe <laughs> maybe all right dan there's some teams that are uh, off to an early surprise, you could say the New Jersey Devils are one of those. That's my pick to stick. I think the New Jersey Devils have enough balanced scoring. I think that team has been built the right way. At least nine players as of Wednesday night have three-plus goals. I mean, that's uh, the kind of balanced scoring you'd love to see. You know, uh, credit Ray Shiro. You and I agree on this. So there's really no brawl here because yeah, okay. Ray Shiro went out and got offense. They, they grabbed uh, Nico Hirscher. Hirscher. I'll say it right eventually, I promise. Nico Heischer, they go and he's putting up points. And Adam Henrique, and they've added a lot of offense. They've solidified that team in a very good way. And in the Metro Division, Bob, you know as well as anybody, you've got to score goals to be competitive in the Metro. And that's exactly what New Jersey is doing. Let's flip the page to team number two that may or may not stick around. The LA Kings missed the playoffs last year. Jonathan Quick missed most of the year. And do they stick around, do you think? They've had a great start. No, uh, the LA Kings are in a tougher division. I think the Pacific Division is much tougher than the Metro Division is this year. At least to um, start. Yeah, I think Edmonton and Anaheim will improve. Uh, plus, San Jose is good like they always are. It's not like New Jersey and the Metro with teams like Philly, Washington, and Arizona, um, Carolina rather to beat up on. So I see New Jersey as a potential division winner. I see LA in a tougher division not staying there all year. Let me tell you why LA is going to stick around okay. 100%. Shot well, we suppression. A little yeah, bit. absolutely. Okay. Right. Shot suppression in LA. Uh, Jonathan Quick, his goals against average under two to this point in the year. Right. They are big, they are heavy, they've added some offense this year. Gone is Daryl Sutter. You know, he, he really put the clamps on that team. Now they're trying to play offense under uh, John Stevenson, former coach of the Flyers. A and it's, it's working. They're going to win enough games. They're always a tough out when they get to the playoffs because they're so big and heavy. I like LA to stick around this year. They're not off to the terrible start they got off to last year because of goaltending issues. Team number three, 
the poor, poor Vegas Knights. They called me to play goaltender. I declined. I don't have good enough <laughs> health insurance. Because you take yeah. a look here at the graphic, it's just been one after the other. Now, Calvin Picard didn't play goal for Vegas. They actually put him through waivers so they could grab Malcolm Subban. But boy, Flurry out with a concussion. Subban out. Oscar Dance gets hurt earlier this week. And now uh, Maxime Legacy. Yeah, and or someone Legace, you, rather, yeah. Uh, I got it here. It's Legasse. I think we go. I think we think Manny Legacy. He, he, yeah, he's yeah. the fifth goaltender. I'm, yeah. I'm not that interested. <laughs> yeah. And here's the sixth for you. So Dylan Ferguson. I no disrespect to these guys. Dylan Ferguson just this year alone in the WHL. He's, yeah, he's for on the Cam, emergency recall. Cam Loops Blazers. He's got a uh, and 13 games played, a 405 goals against average, 878 save percentage. They might be better off bringing a big fat guy out of the stands <laughs> and sticking him between the pipes. I mean, no disrespect to the kid, but he's not going to. He's not an NHL level goaltender. No, no, and he's not going to. And play I don't. That, that's why I don't think Vegas. Vegas has to get healthy in goal. And I think we, we said back in the first show, there's just too many holes in that lineup for them to maintain this. Although I am. See, for I him. disagree because you know what, guys have surprised me. You okay, take a look right. here. One guy making it go. Uh, Oscar Lindbergh had just 24 points with the Rangers over a few season span. He's making it work. Look at that play there. Gets behind the Colorado defense, buries it. You have to love that speed. Now, here's a couple players you might recognize. David Perron over to James Neal. They've got some guys who were knocked down a few pegs. I mean, mentally, when you get cast off in the expansion sure, draft, sure. you get knocked down a few pegs. They've got guys with something to prove. That's why they got off to the hot start. They're also playing a lot of games at home in the early season to get their legs. I actually think Vegas, because the Western Conference doesn't have a great second tier, mm. Oh, they're going to make the playoffs, I think, well, because Flurry will eventually get healthy, and they've got their number one guy back. Dare I say, in Vegas, they're playing with house money or the Golden Knights. Oh, you're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dan, who's the first coach to go? Um, we teased early you think it's going to be Elaine Vigneault. Yeah, you we're getting to that quarter pole of the season when guys' seats get turned up, heat gets turned up okay. now. You look at the Rangers, you can't have a start this bad and heat not come to the coach. The Rangers are, are like bread without yeast. They need a spark. They need something to rise. They've got so many pieces. Pavel Bushnevich is, uh, you know, on top of it. Mika Zibanejad on top of it this season. And they're still not winning hockey games. They, they really should be better than they are. Well, they're not getting any goaltending, Dan. I mean, uh, last season, uh, it was the worst season of his career for Henrik Lundqvist. He had a 274 goals against average, a 910 save percentage. He turns 36 this year, and so far his numbers are even worse. He's 3-4-2. and two. His goals against is up to 321. That's unheard of for Henrik Lundqvist. His save percentage is below 900 and 898. How much can you fault Elaine Vigneault for going to his horse, Henrik Lundqvist? I don't blame him for that. Lundqvist just has to play better like he always has. You know, it's interesting because the Rangers are also having defensive issues. Um, I'm going to throw a Nick crazy name out there before we sign off. I don't, no heat will come to him for a while, but if the Capitals don't turn it on by midseason, Barry Trotz could be in just a, a little bit of hot water as they need to jump start and get through that hangover. But agreed, Bob, agreed, agreed. Okay, we agree on that. Yes. Look at that. Yeah, All Trotz. right, I want to thank everybody at Duquesne University, everybody at Pittsburgh Hockey Now. Check it out, pittsburghhockeynow.com. Articles from me, Bob Grove, Mike the Chive. It's been a blast, kids. We'll do it again in a few weeks. Until then, have fun.